The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Now, let's go to Hebrews 10. We're in the 10th chapter. We've been studying 8, 9, and 10 on the New Covenant. We've been going over some uh, doctrines that are important to the New Covenant, according to the writer of Hebrews. We're looking at verses uh, 5 through 10. Also, notice the date on your paper should be the 26th. If you're keeping up with it, I know John is. I put 624, which was Sunday, and this is 26, according to the people. I just show up, uh, which is a good thing, I guess. Uh, verse, verse 5 through 10. Now, I want you to do something when we go through it because it will come back to be important. Notice there is a series down there uh, in my introduction on the word come. Do you see it on your paper? The word come is very important in this section. So one of the things I would like to have you do is every time you see the word come, <laughs> note it. Okay, note it. Uh, and um, because that'll be important in a moment. He's therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, now he's into Psalms. If you have a study Bible, you'll see that we're into Psalms 40, verse 6 through 8. Sacrifice and offerings thou hast not desired, but a body thou hast prepared for me. Now that's prophecy. That's Davidic prophet, uh, prophecy of the Messiah. And... When the Messiah comes, he's going to wear this. He's going to put it on and wear it. This is going to be, Christ is going to say to the Father, uh, this body you have prepared for me, and he's going to tell you why. You understand that? You'll see this in a moment. Sacrifice and offerings thou hast not desired, but a body thou hast prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, what's the body for? For sacrifice and offering for what? Sin. That's, that's Messianic prophecy. Thou has no pleasure. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for thin, sin, thou has no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come. There it is again. In the roll of the book, it is written of me, and he's talking about Psalms 40, Messianic prophecy of David, to do thy will, O God. And after saying above, sacrifice and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast not desired, nor hast thou taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. And he comes back and he says, stop and think about that a moment. Then he said, behold, I've come to do thy will. He takes away the first old covenant in order to establish the second new covenant. By this will, which is to come and offer his body a sacrifice and offering for what? Sin. By this will, that's the directive will to the Messiah. By this will, we have been sanctified. We, church age believers, new covenant believers, have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. The old covenant could never do that. Do you understand that? could never do that. It only pointed to the day when that would be, be your gift of Christ died on a cross for your sins. By this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for what? Once for all. Okay? So that's where we're going today after a word of prayer. We're going to go in and I want you to Look at some things because the word come is just dynamite to this passage. Because what he's going to do, and this was in Psalms. He's going to show you the first coming and the second coming of Christ, which people didn't understand because what separated them was the mystery of the church. 
but you can see it in the word come. Now, the word come, we use, I mean, the average Christian understands there's the first coming of what? Second coming. And he's going to talk about both of them in this text with the word coming. And, and it's just, it's, it's just good. I mean, I don't, it's, this is just phenomenal. So let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get into this discussion because what he's talking about in, out of this uh, Psalms 40 Messianic passage, he's talking about why he came the first time, why he's going to come a second time. Both of them are mentioned here, but they didn't understand that there was a first and second. They just thought there was the coming of Christ in the Old Testament because the mystery was the church would separate them. You with me? Okay, it's important. Let's have a word of prayer. Uh, as a believer, priest, and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, because you live in the new covenant of the church age, if you believe that Jesus died for your sins, your sins, was buried and raised on, from the dead on the third day, that's called the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. When you believe it, Romans 1, 16, the gospel is the power of God to save you to those who believe when you do, then God gives you the gift of eternal life. For by grace we're saved through faith, the gospel. Saved by grace through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift of God. It's a gift. Now, what would hinder that? The Bible's a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. What would hinder that? is personal sin because it, it that's the results of carnality. Carnality, you have evidence of sin in your life. Your conscience would tell you, the Holy Spirit would tell you, the Bible would tell you, probably your friends would tell you if they love you. <laughs> what do I do? I confess my sin. Jesus took care of the sin on the cross. This is not about salvation. It's about spirituality. You're carnal. You need to be spiritual. How do I move from carnality to spirituality? Confess my sin. I'm back. So that's very important to you. So you take care of that business. If we confess our sins, mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, avert sins, when you confess them, he forgives you and cleanses you. That cleansing puts you back into fellowship under the ministry of the Holy Spirit, according to 1 John 1, 5. <clears throat> so, Father, we thank you today for these come our way to study by, by uh, automobile and by Internet, but we're in a classroom. Those on the Internet need to understand that this lesson comes from a classroom setting and they need to isolate themselves into a classroom setting without distractions, turn certain things off. That would be a distraction. You don't take telephone calls and all these different things uh, during this hour of study. And that's so that you can hear the word of God, understand the word of God, believe it. So it can become a foundational faith in your life so that you can walk by faith and not by sight. So father, we thank you for that in Jesus name. Amen. Well, let's go back to our passage and lo look up here. In this passage of, of Psalms, 40 verses 6 through 8, he's going to tell you two important doctrines of the church age historically. He's going to say the virgin birth and the impeccability. Both of those are connected to the body of Christ. So there's two words in this passage uh, of Hebrews 10, 5 through 9 that are really important. The word come and the word body. Now, the word will of God is also important, but I want you to focus on two things because why did he come the first time? Why is he coming the second time? All of these are important. So uh, two doctrines are going to come out of this passage. I'm going to touch one of them tonight, and the next time we assemble, I'll touch the second one. The first one we're going to discuss tonight is virgin birth, called virgin conception. And... The next one will be impeccable. He who knew no sin, 2 Corinthians 5.21, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That We will study that subject. These are two key doctrines of the new covenant church age. These are key doctrines. So, now, in looking at our passage, what's important is to look at the prophecy of which is in, recorded in our Bible of Hebrews 10 verses 5 through 7 then an explanation in 8 and 9 and a conclusion of verse 10 are you with me okay 
I say that. I know it probably irritates people. It's a bad habit I got to repeat that kind of stuff. I'm just, it's kind of like a reminder. Most all pastors have something to say, are, are you, are you, st are you, your ears open and your, and your mind open to this stuff? It's very important. I don't want, I don't, I don't want to waste your time in, in, in this study and not get anything. So, too important. Now, we're going to deal with one tonight and one, and both of them are connected with the sacrificial body of Christ. Now, isn't this, and when we, when we get through this, I want you to understand, you know, you know what the church is called in regard to Christ? His body. First Corinthians, the 12th chapter. And he says, you know, what's significant to, to what, you, what first you got to understand that the church is the body of Christ on earth. The second thing you have to understand is the body's made up of what? Spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts. First Corinthians, the 12th chapter. And everybody, if, at, when do I get in the body of Christ, the church? Point of salvation. How long am I in it? Forever. Forever. Listen, when he comes back, the, ha the, the church that's already died and in heaven is going to come back with him. And we who are alive are going to be up with them. Boom, there it is. <clears throat> come on now. That's big stuff right there. Nobody had that kind of promise. Well, anyhow, here we are. And I want you to pay attention to the word come in this. <clears throat> now, when you read through it, we got it in verse 5. It is there, right? And when's the next time you find it? Verse 7. When's the next time you find it? 9. Do you see that? Now, here's why, why, what, what I've got to teach you. I've got to teach you that 5 and 6 deals with the first coming of Christ, and there's something unique connected with his body. Verses 7 through 10 deals with another aspect of that, deals with another aspect of that, and it deals with his body. So let's go back and take a look at that for a moment. He says, when he comes, and, and listen, verse 5 and 6 is one Greek word, which you can't see in English. The English just says come, right? But that's not, listen, there is one Greek word in verse that covers verse 5 and 6, and there is a different word come, a different Greek, a completely different Greek word in verses 7 through 10. And you'll see that as we, as we see that. Now, I'm going to tell you that's really important. Now, you can't see it in English, and I, and I hate that, that you can't see that. But in the Greek language, you can see that, and, it, and it's very clear. Note the word come in the English is used three times, five, seven, nine. Note come is related to the Messianic quotation of Psalms, Messianic quotation prophecy of Psalms 40, 6 through 8. Are you with me? I don't. I, I got to break that. <laughs> Only time I really think that it's that I, I shouldn't do that is when Carol Davenport sets in here. And uh, I can just see her blink her eyes and go like, I wish she wouldn't do that. Because um, she she teaches in our our school uh, homiletics and public speaking, and so <laughs> I attended every time to learn. Note, here's another thing. Though the word "come" consists of two different Greek words. In verse five, the word "come" up in verse five, the word "come" is "iser kolmai." Now, when you, "ice" is a preposition. And that what is interesting in this passage, it, the, see, it says when he comes into, well, the word ice is on the front of the verb come, and it also tails it. That word into is ice plus the accusative. So what you've got, you don't need ice on the front of it. When you got it on the back, it's put on the front to show you that it was a prophetic word that's looking to be fulfilled. When he comes into what? See, he's already in the scriptures. Come on now. He's already in the scriptures, right? Prophetically, Psalms. Now, what Psalms is saying is when he comes, something big's going to be up. Now, we call that the incarnation in theology, Christ coming into the world. And so the writer is really into this thing right here, and he uses the word when he comes, when he comes, Ice plus the into the world, 
And it should be translated more correctly, inner. It's dealing with the entrance into, like, here's a building, and the person is standing here. He, he's expected to come. The door opens, and now he's, he's entered. That's that word. Okay? And it covers verses 5 and 6. Here we go. When he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offerings thou hast not desired, but a body thou hast prepared for me. He's talking about, that's messianic, that's Christ. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast, thou hast taken no pleasure. Okay? Verse 5 and 6. And both of those, that's connected. Even in English, there were, those are connected. Now, when we come to verse 7, he, he, behold, now, he's entered in, right? Where's he, where's he in? World. In the world. He's entered into the world. We call that the incarnation. He's entered into the world. How'd he come? Virgin birth, right? How, how Jesus, he came from heaven, but how'd he get into the world? Came through, came through the Virgin Mary. That's the story in the Bible. Came through the Virgin Mary. All right. So there, he's in there. All right. Now watch. In verse 7, the writer goes on. Then I said, behold, I've come. Now he's inside the world. When this becomes, he came, comes in here. Now, now the word heckle, the word heckle is the word for arrival. Now that I'm here, everything is based, now that I'm here, everything is based on the will of God. We call that specifically, my body, you have prepared for what we know to be the cross, burial and resurrection. The arrival point focuses on Christ once he's entered the world, there has to be now the arrival of the point where he is under the directive will of God to complete with his body on the cross for what purpose? Sin. Sin. And he uses a completely different word, means it's different than entering. It's he has come on stage understanding that he has to redo the responsibility of fulfilling the will of God in regard to the issue of sin because sacrifices and offerings of the old covenant never satisfied the complete completion of the work or the finished work for sin. It always pointed to Christ coming and completing that. Right? No, it's clear. I mean, he says that very clearly, does he not? I mean, he says it very clearly. I mean, it's not up for debate on it. Behold then, Behold, I have come in the roll of the book. It is written of me to do the will, to do, do the will, O God. Right? Then he goes on. Now he goes on to explain this. He goes, once he's arrived in the world, right? His arrival means he is very knowledgeable of his mission. His mission is is to go to the cross and pay the penalty for the sins of the world. John says, behold, this is when this arrives. Behold the Lamb of God that's come to take away the sin of the world. Agreed? And Jesus begins his three, year, three, three and a half year ministry to go to the cross and complete the work. Uh, to tell it is finished in John 19.30. Stop. I, I have not left Psalms. All that's in Psalms. Th look how privileged we are from a historical standpoint. We're able to be look back at it and go like, wow. They were struggling with it from the prophecy side. They were struggling with it. They shouldn't have because it's very clear in the Psalms why he can't, why, when he entered into the world, there would be an arrival time for him to go to the cross. And so... You know, the book of Matthew, 
you have two chapters on his, on his entering, and the rest of the book is about his arrival. Come on, Michael. Michael rode the boat. Oh. Yeah. Or, some, or something like that. He rode something. I'm not quite sure. Um, so this is, this is really interesting the way the writer of Hebrews is pulling that out. I, it's really, it's just phenomenal teaching on, on his part. Then look at verse 8 and 9. He goes into a little explanation. He says, and, and saying, a, a, after saying above, sacrifice and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast not desired, nor, uh, nor hast thou pleasure in them which are offered according to the law. Then he said, behold, I have come. He uses the word helko. Stays with that same word in, ver in verse 7. Helco. The, about the arrival. What's my, once what I've entered, virgin birth, then, then there's an arrival when I've got to complete my mission. And everything now is about the will of God. Everything. Once he enters his earthly ministry, everything, everything but everything is about the will of God. And the will of God, the directive will of God, is to complete his mission. Go, you've got to go to the cross. And Gethsemane tells the story of the struggle, doesn't it? Uh, then he said, Behold, I have come to do thy will. And by, do, by, by doing the will, he, complete, he, he completes the first and opens up the second. He takes away the first to establish the second. By this will, verse 10, by this will, by this will, that's in verse 7, that's in verse 9, is now in verse 10. It's used three times. By this will, we have been sanctified. We, church age believers, new covenant believers, have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once for all. Now, you see, what we've gone to, we've gone, this, listen, listen. Virgin birth is up here. Arrival puts us into impeccability. That's all about impeccability. He who knew sin, he who knew no sin became sin for us, right? That we might be made the righteous of God him. That's impeccability. When when did that when did it when did the importance of the doctrine switch from virgin birth to impeccability is when he realized out of the will of God that he arrival time was there. He starts his earthly ministry headed to the cross. Right out of the chute, John says, this is why you're here. Right? Well, how fully John understood it, I'm not sure. But he certainly understood that Jesus was the fulfillment of Psalms 40. That's for sure. All right. That's Glenda's, Glenda's calling you. <laughs> <laughs> Ah. Don't be picking on Linda. Uh, I can hear my wife. I can hear my wife saying, "Don't be, don't be picking on Linda." Glenda, don't be picking on Glenda. Don't be picking on Glenda. Uh, so I, I laid all that out in my introduction to you. Let's look at four things tonight. When you compare, now this is really important. Are you still in Hebrews? Yes. All right. Keep your place, and let's go to Psalms 40. Because my first point has to do with a change that's made from Psalms 40 to Hebrews. And the reason is that Christ completed his mission. So we're in the 40th chapter. We're looking at verses 6, 7, 8. I'm looking at verse 6 where, where this starts in uh, Psalms 40, verse 6. Are you with me? By that, I mean everybody's in the scripture with me. I guess it's, I guess I'm a lost cause. Uh, set, set, watch this now. I want you to tell me what's different. There's something different in this verse than in Hebrews. 
Sacrifice and meal offerings thou hast not desired, my ears thou hast opened, or maybe your Bible says pierced, my ears thou hast opened or pierced, burnt offerings and sin offerings thou hast not required or desired. Are you with me? <laughs> I'll never, I'll never break myself of that. I never will. I never will. I don't know. Now it's gotten in my head and it just irritates me now. I'll break it because I can't stand to think about it. Um, well, I'm having trouble to find another word to do that with. Which, which has been changed? What's been changed? There's been a change. I mean, a very stark change. What about it? In verse, in Psalms 40, verse 6, my ears thou hast opened or pierced. Are you with? Do you see that? Right? What, 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 the writer of Hebrew, what did he say? A body thou hast prepared. How about that? Now, there's a difference there, right? There's a difference. So let's discuss that because there's a difference. There's a translational difference there. In Psalms 46, there is a phrase, my ears you have pierced. In Hebrews 10.5, it's translated, but a body thou hast prepared. The word that's used in the Greek language to repair is a word in the Greek language that means to restore something that's been broken or torn, like a fishnet. They have to, they have to um, sew it or do something, whatever they do with the fishnet. When it, you know, they have to repair it, right? Mm -hmm. to re they have to repair it to get it back to fishing because there's a hole in it. It means to repair something. To re, it means to restore something to back, back and put it back in service kind of idea. That's the word prepare. You have prepared, and so remember that the word that the Greek used was the body, a body you have prepared for for me. A body you have prepared for me. It requires virgin birth and impeccability. Go to cross. It requires those two things. He's got to be born virgin birth, and he has to remain uh, impeccable until he gets through with the cross. All right, and so, and what is that something, what is that something that was, that it's fellowship, absolute, complete, 100% fellowship with God has been broken because of Adam's sin. Genesis 2 said, where did the sin idea come into that required God to send his only begotten son into the world to die to conquer it? Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 45 says there's a first Adam and a last Adam that, that are federal heads of the human race. One the unbeliever and one the believer. 1 Corinthians 15, 45. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, it says in Christ all, in Adam all die, in Christ all are made alive. What, what, what put us in Adam? Romans 5, 12, wherefore is by one man Adam, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death was passed on to all mankind for all of sin. Are you with me? <laughs> that lasted about a half a second. <laughs> now, so it requires us to go in and take a look in the Hebrew of what's the word pierce. What is the word pierce? Well, it's a cow perfect. It's a second, it's second singular masculine, the word pierce. Now, the NAS. The New American Standard Bible footnote, the study Bible, uh, really hits it on the head because this is the, the difference in the Hebrew being a little more liberal and the Greek wanting to be a little more specific. And so the, the, the Greek that's going to be translated out of the, out, uh, into the New Testament is going to come out of the Septuagint. That is the, the Greek translation uh, which was a, a, a common Bible in the time of Jesus Christ, the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Hebrew Bible. And that's where this type of stuff comes from. And so they, they explained to us what the Hebrew word meant and why it was translated Pierce into the Greek and what that really means. And here's what their explanation is. It's pretty good. It says, 
an, an expression signifying the word pierced, an expression signifying obedience based, and this is true, based either on the custom of piercing an ear as a sign of voluntary perpetual service as described in Exodus 21, 6, or on the idea of hearing to obey what God says, that he is the master, like in Isaiah 50, 4 and 5. And I'll tell you, they're right on the money on it. Instead of, and the point is that instead of an external ceremony only, David realizes that God wants your heart. And the writer understood that. And what God wants is not just your heart. He wanted the heart of Christ. Do you understand that? Because this is a messianic prophecy. When, when, after he comes, he's got to buy into this lock, stock, and barrel 100%. That's what it means, give your heart. You do know that even, even the unbeliever knows that when you give your heart to something, you're, get, you're given 100%. Now, you... You may fudge on it. You may, or may never buy into it. But even the unbeliever, I knew that when I played football and I wasn't a believer. I understood what I said. Give me, listen, you got to leave it all on the field. Uh, listen, during this, you used to, Marcos used to say, you don't date during Hebrew, uh, during uh, practice be, or ball games because your heart goes to me. You give your heart to football. Now, there are some of us that actually believe that. And then I found out some of them didn't. The girls never did understand that philosophy. That's okay. So here's that word. And that word, that pierced became the word prepared. Pierced became the, with an idea of 100% commitment to the directive will of God who is your master. Either way, it's 100% commitment. Either word in context of meant that very thing. It, it is the idea of 100% commitment to the directive will of God, like in Ephesians 6.6, 6, where it says your whole heart. I mean, your whole heart. I mean, who doesn't want that? Who, who doesn't commit themselves to that? Like marriage and family and church and ministry and all that stuff. I mean, that half-hearted stuff, it don't fly for anything, does it? Half-hearted? Whatever that is. Behold, he says, behold, and this is the key. Behold, I have come. I have arrived on the scene. I've already in the world. Now I'm on, I'm on job. I'm at work. I am 100%. I, here's what the prophecy meant to Jesus. I've got to be 100% committed <laughs> To the why I'm here. Listen. Do you think anything less is required of you and I? If you do you're wrong. Now we don't give him that. Most of the time. We give him straps. Scraps and what's left over. Broken hearts and all the other stuff that goes with it. You know. I mean how many times do you give 100% when the 100% got you 30% back? The next relationship you go into, you don't give no 100%. It takes a while to mend that baby that's broken, doesn't it? That's good poker playing. I like that. I like that. So pierced, pierced became preparing the body for what? Sacrifice for sin. Here's the second point that's important. A body prepared for me expresses Jesus Christ's submission to the directive will of God regarding the sacrificial death, his sacrificial death for the sins of the world. And we see this enormous struggle as it got close in Gethsemane, in the Garden of Gethsemane in Matthew 26, when he keeps repeating to himself, not my will, but your will be done. Now, I know he's praying, right? The only person who listened to the prayer was Jesus and God. Everybody else was asleep. Right? He took the three top guys that he knew would be able to be put 100, 100% into the ball game. They didn't know what 100% required. And how patient was he with them? 
He was a lot patient than my coach was. He was very, he was very patient with him. You know, you can't get blood out of a turnip, apparently. That was his, one of his philosophies, I guess. And so he struggles in Gethsemane over this issue. Not my will, but thy will. That was bigger than you can possibly imagine. Because the will he's talking about began in the eternal life conference and is now in and has set in prophecy for all of his years is now on the front line and depending on his obedience. Everything, everything in the angelic conflict and why man is on earth and what purpose is man is all rolled up into one decision he can make. And that is go to the cross and die for the sins of the world. Be separated from God. Never been that before. Never. I mean, most of us, well, I don't know about most of us. Gethsemane, that Gethsemane prayer is a lot bigger than you think it is. When he says to himself, to God in prayer, I am really struggling of what this is going to cost me with you. When I go to that cross and hang on there for the sins of the world. I want you to know. I don't know that I can grasp that as much as I understand the obedience to do it. Isn't that true? And a lot of times in our life we're just obedient to do it. We don't know how this is going to work out. I have to do what God tells me to do and I have to be loyal with it. It's up to him to figure out where the chips are going to fall. That's, that's pretty tough stuff in it. That's pretty tough stuff. Listen, I'm not saying this is easy. He tells you it's not. Does he not say this was not easy? If you think this was a picnic, it wasn't. Oh, well, Jesus died on the cross for my sins. Big deal. So what? <laughs> huh. hmm. So we have passages like the rest of the new covenant. Understand the whole, everything you read about the new covenant that, that starts with, with this kind of stuff right here after his arrival and his identity. After you get through Matthew 2, he's in his arrival stuff. And all the way to the end, this is what this is about. And all the writers really, they struggled with it for a while. But the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit just broke open their lives to the truth of all how that fit, these guys began pinning and writing like crazy, didn't they? We've got these great books, these great epistles of the new covenant and what this means to the church. It just, it just amazes me how little the church has taught about these great truths of the, of, the, of the new covenant. These truths are so gigantic. And, and people go, well, I've never heard this before. And I go, I just feel so bad. I mean, I, what, do, what do you say? I mean, I, what do you say? I go like, come here Tuesday night. I hope you climb out of that. I mean, I understand where you come from. A body prepared for you, for me, a body prepared for me that must go to the cross and suffer for the sins of the world. In 1 Peter 2.24, Peter writes, he himself means he alone. He himself, he alone bore our sins. That's why we're saved by grace through faith and not by works. It's a gift because he himself bore our sins on his body on the cross. He bore whose sins? Our sins. Where? On his body on the cross. Boy, did Peter have that right. Hmm? You know where he got that? After the cross, because he wasn't right before it, was he? Got that after. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds we are healed. People take that so far out of context, it's just irritating to me. This is a salvation verse. <clears throat> and if you come to the cross, you have that for by his, by, listen, look, the only time this really makes sense to you is when you start working with broken people. World has just cracked them in half, broke them wide open, they're, they're broken people. I'm not, I'm not talking broken by the Holy Spirit where you go like, oh, I got to change my life. I'm talking about broken by the world where there is no hope, no hope, no hope, no hope, no hope at all. <clears throat> I 
And they live with that person that's broken every day with no hope. Can you imagine living without any hope? And then they buy into it, and then they become a victim of no hope. They buy into it. The worst thing you do is ever buy into it, that you're a victim. Not in Christ. You're a victor in Christ. Climb out of that self-pity. Listen, you may have been terribly, terribly abused. You don't have to stay there. Christ went on that cross, not only for you, but the person that abused you. He went on that cross for both of you. Went on that cross for both of you, not just one of you. And listen, he's willing to heal. He's willing. He, God prepared a body for broken people because that body that bore our sin is a way to be restored. Do you understand that? That's what the word prepared means. He prepared a way for the broken people in this world to find hope, to come to God through Jesus Christ. To believe that he went on that cross for them. To restore them. The whole cross is about restoring us. It's about restoring us. From our brokenness. That's the word. Prepared. He prepared me to restore you. He broke me with sin. To restore you from it. Oh my goodness people. My goodness. Why would you not accept this as a gift and come into the restoration in time and eternity? Gosh. Why would you back away from that? Are you too broken to be saved? Prodigal wasn't. Prodigal, he hit the bottom of the barrel and said, this is no way to live. And so he didn't, oh, I don't know, but the Bible doesn't say is that he, he contemplated suicide. What he finally came, he may have, what his final conclusion was, I want to live and I can't live where I am. I can't live in the condition I'm in. I can't live in the way I think. I've got to go back to the Father and be restored to some way because I am dying a slow death. Gosh, we've got the good news. We have the good news because he brought us the good news. The good news is that, listen, he can heal the brokenhearted. He can mend the broken spirit. This is a, a mighty God through Jesus Christ. You don't have to be, a, you don't have to go broken one more day and it don't take you a lifetime to fix it. It takes the ministry, the Holy Spirit, and the word of God. It takes faith in Jesus Christ, faith in what he tells you, the walk he requires. It's all a healing process. How do I know? Because he says, for by his wounds, by whose wounds? Your wounds? Yes. Mm. By his wounds, you're healed. What's the healing? It's the restoring. And God prepared a body for him to do that. That, that was the motivation when everything else tanked on him. He held to that, that I understand God's goal in this. And I'm willing to do that for the brokenness of people because in his three years of ministry, all he did was would deal with broken people. If you study the life of Christ, he spent his whole life on earth after he arrived dealing with broken people that motivated him when he hung on the cross. I know what this is for. I remember this is, this is for so-and-so. And, -so and I, this, I mean, he had faces. He could put faces with prophecy. And he looks over at one guy in the cross and looks over at the other guy in the cross and says to one of them, I like your attitude hanging up here. Today you'll be with me in paradise. <laughs> I don't know if it's a shock when he got there or not, but I know he believed and so he got the promise. Who knows when we get where we're going, how the promises are just going to drop in bright lights into our soul. That's just going to be magnificent because, well, I heard it and I thought about it. But, wow, I never imagined it to be this good. I mean, the guy said to me, today you'll be in paradise. I thought, I thought to myself, 
Oh, that'd be good. Well, I never imagined it'd be this good. Da 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 da. Uh, how good is that stuff, baby? And I'm telling you, this is this is what we this everyone this is what we got to share with people. Don told me tonight coming in, and he said, "Ron, there's just so many hungry people out there. There's just so many hungry people out there. Yes, there is. There's just people hungry, broken, no answers." They go to this one. They go to that one. They didn't get any. They don't get any. They don't get. Fi- they don't get. They don't get restored. They don't get fixed, because it comes through not not walking by sight, but walking by faith. Where does faith come? It comes from hearing, hearing the word of God. Listen, you can't keep fighting it. At some point, you got to surrender to it, just like Jesus. There has to be a Gethsemane in your life where you just submit to it and go like, "Listen, I, I, I think this is for me." Then you'll find out it is for you. Then you will really find out it's for you. One way you will, God will begin to answer your prayers and it will shock you. <laughs> it will shock you. I wonder if that was just coincidental. Try, we'll try it again and see. After a while, you go like, that's the real stuff. Listen now, it's what he says. In 1 John 2, 2, for he himself is the propi- propitiation. That's taking the judgment for sin. Taking the full weight of the judgment of sin. For he himself, he alone, is the propitiation. That's that's appeasing the full judgment of sin for God. Is the propitiation for our sins and not ours only, but those of the whole world. -ah. Boy, that's inclusive. Here's this third thing the body prepared for me. Began with the Messianic prophecy of Isaiah 7.14. Of the virgin birth. It became the theology of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. With what we call prophetic Christology of Matthew 1. And Luke 1, 2 and 3. That's where you hear the whole story of the virgin birth. Matthew 1 and Luke 1, 2 and 3. Gabriel appears to Mary. With a directive will of God. That's what he, that, listen, he still shows up right here at Bible study and does it every week with you. <clears throat> now, whether you not pay attention or not, I don't know. But he shows up and gives you something every week that's pertinent to the directive will in your, in your life. It's the darndest thing I ever saw. He's going to point it out to you too. You may not get everything, but you'll get enough to walk away and go like, ooh, that's a burr under my saddle. Gabriel appears to Mary with the directive will of God regarding her, her role in Isaiah 7.14. He does this in Luke 1, 26 through 56. That's a long dissertation. He says to her in the directive will, he says, you will conceive in your womb. You will bear a son and you will name him Jesus. That's Luke 1, 31. He goes on to say, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child, the Holy Child, In the womb, the holy child shall be called the son of God. You know why? Because his father is God. It's not Joseph. It is God. You know what Mary said when the angel got through? She had a lot of questions. He answered them as best he could. You know what she said at the end? Now listen, to this is 100% commitment. This is what we're talking about, 100% commitment. Stuff you don't do when you come to Bible study, you should do, because God speaks to your heart in thundering ways. You know what she said? Listen to what she said in Luke 138. Listen to what she said. May it be done to me according to your word. You know what that is? That's 100 commitment to the direct will of God. That's 100%. May it be done to me. Listen, I could probably sit here and ask a quick, here's, here's what, I've asked you a few questions that I think are important. You've answered them, thank you. I probably got a thousand more to ask you, but look, here's what I understand. I understand what you're, I understand. I will conceive of my womb, I will bear a son, we'll call him Jesus. It will be the Holy Spirit that does it. The power of the Most High will overshadow me and the, the Holy Child in my womb will be called the Son of God. And she salutes and drives forward. 
She never wavers in it. There's no difference what God expects out of your life. When you hear what God wants out of your life, you've got to be committed to it. Why don't you say, may it be done to me according to your word, and have it done. That's, that's understanding the faith, the faith business. You walk by faith, not by sight. So he comes to Joseph. Gabriel appears to Joseph, engaged to Mary, with a direct will regarding his life. And, and listen, not his role. Listen to me now. Don't miss this. Not according to his role, but Mary's role. Oh, you'll need to go back and read that again. He says to Joseph, I, I'm pulling out of Matthew 120. You need to read the whole thing to get it. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. And he said, Joseph, son of David, that puts him on prophecy. That puts him on something David has written. Like we're talking about. Or some other prophecy that was definitely messianic, like Isaiah 714. Joseph, son of David, that's messianic. Do not be afraid. Now watch what he says. Do not be afraid. That's to Joseph. But listen what it's about. Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Now what was he afraid of? He was eat up with it. What was he afraid to? To take Mary as his wife. Why? Because she was pregnant after three months of absence from him. Went up to the mountain to see Elizabeth. Came back pregnant. You know it wasn't his. Because Mary said no, no, no way Jose. Because she says to the angel. How is this going to be? Because I'm a virgin. And I love Joseph. But no way Jose. Jose for Joseph. No way. And so he's afraid to take her because he's got human viewpoint. He's not thinking doctrine. He's thinking, he's thinking natural. He's thinking natural birth, natural conception. He's missed Isaiah 714. So you know what the writer, you know what the Gabriel does? Brings it back to Isaiah 714. He quotes it to him. He quotes it to him. He quotes it to him. He says, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife for the child who has been conceived is of the Holy Spirit. And then he gives him Isaiah 714. You know, and you know what? How did it work out for Joseph? Matthew 124. Joseph awoke from his dream and did exactly as the angel commanded. That's 100% commitment. If you think that God's going to require less of you when he reveals the directive will of God to your life, that he is going to settle for anything less than 100% commitment to it, you're absolutely wrong. If you learn nothing else from this study, learn that. He want, Listen, Christ give 100% to you? Yes, he did. And, 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 and on the basis of his faith and on the basis of your faith, you give 100%, 100% back to God. Anything less than that is not, it's not going to work for you. You understand that? You can't do it. You can't give a little bit here and take a little bit back. Do a little bit. You, can, you can't do that. You can't walk a little bit by faith and a whole lot by sight. You either walk by faith or you walk by sight. You know, not a little bit pregnant. Right? You've heard people say that. Well, you're not a little bit. So here's my final point. Virgin conception by the Holy Spirit resulted in Jesus being born as what? The only begotten son of God. John 3.16. That's where it says it. Right? For God so loved the world that he gave his what? Only begotten son. That, right? That whosoever should believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Who? Jesus, uh, geez, that's good. So, with the... In 1 Peter 1.19, with the precious blood as a lamb unblemished, that's virgin birth, can be no birth defects, can be no growth defects. Impeccable is no growth defect. We committed no volitional sin before the cross. With the precious blood of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. If Jesus is not conceived by the Holy Spirit, he cannot qualify to bear the sins of the world on the cross, on his body, right? It's on his body. 1 John 2, 2, he himself, we've read that. If Jesus was born by Joseph, conception, 
Jesus would be under Adam's original sin like every other member of the human race. Because Romans 5.12 says that that sin of Adam was passed on to the human race. So I give you passages. You need to study that. Because when you come to salvation, you get eternal redemption. Eternal redemption at the point of salvation. Why? Because listen to me why. It's simple. Christ died once for all. That's how simple that is. All right. Well, as far as I can get tonight. Another doctrine that's important to the new covenant church age. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight that we have seen why Jesus came into the world, how he entered for virgin birth, and his arrival to the will of God and to that point of what was his mission? To go to the cross and bear the sins, our sins on his body, that we wouldn't have to bear them ever again. How thankful we are. That Adam's sin was removed, 13 judicial charges gone. The moment we believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. For those out there tonight that are broken, Christ, Christ went to the cross to bring healing. By his wounds, you are healed. That brokenness in your life, the way the world has broke you, without hope. Don't let, don't let the devil lie to you. In Christ, there is hope. The prodigal son says, I got to go home. Got to go back to the Father and be restored. You're broken. I wonder how he'll receive me. He'll receive you by faith through grace and not of yourself. It'll be a gift. It's the only way God works. And so we pray tonight, Father, for those. What do I have to do to be saved, Ron? I have to believe that Jesus died for my sins. My sins was buried and raised from the dead. And when I believe it, I'm saved. I'm saved by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ based on my faith. I pray for all those broken people tonight. The world has broke you down. You ain't got a dog's chance as you think the world. They've beaten you up so bad and they've called you such names that you've begun to believe it. You've taken on a victim's mentality. Tonight you can come to Christ and be restored. You're back on a journey of wholeness. By his wounds, you are in the healing process. What he accomplished on the cross will bring you into restoration in the grace of God. Come tonight. Come tonight without wavering. Come tonight for salvation in Jesus Christ. In his name we've prayed. Amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us.